quite thrilled to see the economic developments happening around the province in Aboriginal communities. I died seven months ago. I'm working in Butcher. My father Butcher and my uncle Butcher and my grandfather Butcher is family business. Why did you want to have a job? I just wanted to be more independent and socializing. outside for 33 years. It's my uh, place, but it's even harder now. So. I will work at what I love. And when I work at what I love, it comes back tenfold. Today? I sure will. Awesome. I'm a sound editor and designer. I move around a lot. I house sit. I sub it when I can afford it. These aren't my chickens. <laughs> This is an example of how we attack every item in the discard stream to find a different home for it. And if we can't find a different home, we create one locally. Good evening. On behalf of SFU, in partnership with Van City, welcome to Simon Fraser University's Public Square Community Summit featuring Dr. Robert Reich. We are honored to introduce Klahani R. Rorick from the Taltan Nation to bring a traditional First Nations welcome to Dr. Reich's keynote address. Klahani is with the Office for Aboriginal Peoples at SFU. Please welcome Klahani. Anyata, welcome to the SFU Public Square 2013 Community Summit. Izia, my name is Klahani R. Rorik. I am from the Tiskia Crow Clan from the Talton Nation. We would first like to acknowledge ourselves as visitors to the unceded territory of the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish Nations on whose land the Orpheum Theatre resides, and extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on their territories. Agadigi Dene Tia, Daza Du Denwa, Ach Dugi Thana Kenneth D. Creator, open our hearts and minds to the knowledge that we share today. Isini, all my relations, Medu, thank you. In honor of this day, I will share the welcome song composed by the Tiaklap singers.
Please welcome President of Simon Fraser University, Dr. Andrew Petter. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to SFU Public Square. I'm delighted you could join us for this, our second annual community summit on charting BC's economic future. And I'd like to also welcome those of you who are joining us live on WebStream. Let me begin by thanking everyone who submitted video clips and pictures and stories to help create the We Are BC video that was launched tonight. And thanks especially to director Sarah Van Borek, who conceived this crowdsourced project and brought these stories to life. SFU Public Square is a product of SFU's vision to be Canada's most community-engaged research university. That vision makes it our goal for SFU to be BC's public square for enlightenment and dialogue on key public issues, to be the institution to which the community looks for education, for discussion, and for solutions. And we're working very hard to realize that goal year-round at all three of our campuses, in Burnaby, in Surrey, and in Vancouver. But for one week, for one week we do it e with even greater focus and gusto in our community summit. A public square is a forum for democracy, a place to gain information, to voice one's views about the pressing issues of the day, as well as to listen to the views of others. British Columbians are famous for the energy and intensity that we bring to discussions of public issues. We're perhaps a little less famous for our propensity to listen, to ponder, and to seek shared solutions. Yet that surely is what we must do if we wish to thrive in today's world. If we hope to succeed in an increasingly competitive global economy, we must devote less time and effort to exposing our divisions and venting our differences, and more time to identifying mutual interests and reaching shared solutions. What John F. Kennedy said of America and its allies in 1961 might well be said of us today. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Divided, there is little we can do for we dare not meet a powerful challenge at odds and split asunder. With that in mind, we have resolved this week to seek common ground upon which British Columbians might begin to construct an economic agenda that fosters prosperity, equity, and sustainability. No small challenge. The good news is there is growing recognition that these three values are not only intertwined, they're also interdependent. Most British Columbians today regard environmental sustainability as a precondition to any major economic initiative. We are united in our belief that we cannot achieve real prosperity by degrading our natural beauty or passing environmental costs onto future generations. Similarly, an increasing number of British Columbians are concerned that rising inequality 
and declining social mobility threaten prosperity, as Robert Reich reports is happening in the United States. Just last week, the BC Business Council issued a report calling for a BC agenda for shared prosperity, an agenda predicated on the belief that a robust economy requires a vibrant middle class and that business will gain support for measures to create wealth only if all British Columbians are convinced that they will share in that bounty. And of course, and of course we all understand that our province's capacity to address issues like child poverty, like inequality, and Aboriginal rights are tied to our ability to generate wealth. Thus, if ever there were a time to seek a shared strategy for a more prosperous, equitable, and sustainable British Columbia, that time must surely be now. And that's why we decided to make the pursuit of such a strategy the subject and the challenge of this year's Community Summit. Our ambition is to embrace the benefits of collaboration over confrontation. By seeking common ground, common ground we hope to harness energies that would otherwise be dissipated in opposing each other and through this process discover not only that we are better placed to achieve our individual goals, but that we're better placed as a province to thrive on the world stage. I must say I particularly look forward to Robert Reich's perspective on this, in part because the depth of his concern for the negative impacts of inequality is matched by the strength of his conviction in the positive power of education to generate wealth, increase social mobility, and ensure prosperity in an increasingly competitive global knowledge economy. It's a belief that I hope all British Columbians can also unite around. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Van City, our wonderful partner and our co-sponsor for this evening. Van City is one of Canada's largest and most successful credit unions and a global leader in values-based banking. Over the years, Van City has supported this community, its residents, community groups, and yes, educational institutions to help us to be the best that we can. Van City's president and CEO, Tamara Vrooman, is a visionary leader in the business community and a strong advocate for this region. Under her leadership, Van City has shown how it is possible to generate wealth, promote social equity, and protect the environment. So we're fortunate indeed to have such a financial institution in our community, and I would like you to please join with me in thanking Van City and welcoming Tamara Vrooman to the stage. Tamara. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew, for those, those very, very kind remarks. And, and good evening, everyone. And, and thanks to each and every one of you for taking the time to attend this uh, wonderful event tonight. Clearly, the issues and the, the topic of income inequality is one that you're interested in, uh, you're committed to, and one that we can start to converse about this evening. And it's wonderful that we have in our midst a, a political leader, a uh, academic leader, and increasingly uh, a popular leader, such as Dr. Robert Reich, to talk to us about these issues. And income inequality is a critical issue for our province. Research indicates that in the past 30 years in this province, incomes have declined for all but the wealthiest. That means it's not just a financial issue, it's also one of social justice and it has profound implications for the environment as well. At Van City, we believe we need to transform our economic system to make sure it serves everyone, not just a few. We ask ourselves questions like, what is it going to take to create a healthy, environmentally sustainable economy in BC, one that addresses all sorts of inequality? And what role does business and the corporate sector, along with community and government, play in creating that? SFU Public Square is also committed to convening the dialogue on important topics like this, an economy that includes all of us. And for that reason, it made perfect sense for Van City to partner with it in these discussions. And we're so fortunate to have brought Dr. Reich, one of the world's great thinkers on work and the economy, to share his thoughts with the community of Vancouver. But before Professor Reich comes on, I'd like to introduce to you another special part of today's event and evening, Anna Maria Tremonti. Woo! That's good. <laughs> Thank you. 
Anna Maria will ask Dr. Rice some questions of her own after he speaks and then invite questions from you in the audience. Many of you, clearly by the whoos, know Anna Maria, or at least her voice, uh, as the host of CBC Radio's national program, The Current. But she also has had a distinguished career in front of the camera as well. She has served as a foreign correspondent for CBC's The National, based in Berlin, London, Jerusalem, and Washington. She has worked on CBC's investigative program, The Fifth Estate. She has received two Gemini Awards and many, many other honors during her distinguished career. We are indeed privileged to have her with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Anna Maria Tremonti. Good evening. You can feel the energy in this room, and by being here tonight, you are signaling your openness and your curiosity. The man you are here to see tonight will make you think and make you think again. He will challenge perceptions and inaction, and by listening to how he thinks, I predict we will all think some more. Robert Reich has had a storied career, Rhodes Scholar, professor at Harvard, Berkeley, in Washington an advisor to four presidents, cabinet secretary, author of 14 books. He served on the economic transition teams of not one but two U.S. presidents, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. He not only headed the Clinton team, he inspired President Clinton's earliest economic efforts of putting people first, a phrase Mr. Clinton learned from Robert Reich. As Secretary of Labor to President Clinton, Robert Reich's work stood the test of time. More than a decade after he left office, in 2008, you remember 2008, that critical year when we realized so many financial and economic emperors had no clothes, that year, Time magazine named Robert Reich one of the best cabinet ministers of the past century. But the path he's chosen is one where the journey is never complete and where there is always more to consider just around the next curve. His latest effort to tackle the economic and social dilemmas that confront us is a feature-length documentary, Inequality for All. It was released less than a week ago, and I have to urge you to see it as soon as you can. It is both devastating and hopeful. He comes here tonight against a backdrop of economic uncertainty around the world and around the corner. You already know the statistics, the growing income inequality, the persistent debt loads of nations, of households, and the disturbing numbers of unemployed youth. Now we are here as a part of the SFU public square. And though SFU is of course very special and a standout university, students here like their peers elsewhere, increasingly earn an extra set of letters after their degrees. Along with the BA and the BSc, the MBA, the PhD, they get DID, deep in debt. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Dr. Reich will speak to us all and share his ideas and challenge our thinking, and then I'll give him a little bit of the current treatment. I'll interview him. And I'll add some questions that we already have on tape. You will see them on the screens from people who have been part of the SFU Public Square Van City Dialogue. And if you have a smartphone and you want to tweet, we hope to take a few questions from Twitter as well. So let's begin. Please welcome Robert Reich. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Anna Maria, uh, and also Van City SFU. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, as you can see, the economy has worn me down. 
。はい。It's not just the economy. I, I come to you from the United States, the only advanced economy without a functioning government. It's embarrassing. And there are connections between what's happening in the United States and inequality. I want to assure you, if you don't know already, that although Canada and British Columbia are surging toward greater inequality, inequality of income and wealth, and arguably inequality of opportunity, you're nothing relative to the inequality we're experiencing in the United States. That is, you seem to be. Responding to the same forces that are occurring in the United States, but the United States has done, and again, you'll pardon me for saying this, and I hope my compatriots will pardon me for saying this outside the borders of the United States.、Uh, we have not done the job we needed to do over the last 30 years, as the forces I'm about to talk to you about have had a kind of a, a, a separating effect on our population. A centripetal effect, making the rich richer, a smaller number of people getting better and better and better able to exercise wealth and power, and a vast number of people、uh, less and less able.、Uh, the statistics, for example,、uh, the 400 richest Americans now have more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans put together. That is, the 400 richest Americans have more wealth than the bottom half of the United States put together. And anybody who thinks that this has changed since the Great Recession ought to know the latest data as well. And that is that 95 percent of the economic gains in the United States since the recession ended, since the so-called recovery began, 95 percent have gone to the top one percent. In fact, median household income, median. I said median, not average.、Uh, it's important that you distinguish between average and median. Sometimes you hear economists and others talk about average wealth or average income. Whenever you hear average, watch your wallets. <laughs> you know, the basketball pa- player、uh, Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six foot two. <laughs> you. You, you get my my point. The the pe- people at the top bring up the averages. That's why you you want to look at the median. That is the person right in the middle, half above, half below. And the median household income in the United States、uh, keeps on dropping, adjusted for inflation. It's now seven percent below what it was even in the year 2000. And the problem for any economy, for any society, where you have the middle class under greater and greater stress. Is very practical. This is not just an issue of fairness or unfairness, of public morality or lack of morality. This is a very practical issue because when the middle class starts shrinking, or the middle class doesn't have the purchasing power to keep the economy going, then you have a very fragile economic recovery. You have an economic recovery that could easily fall into recession. You have an economic recovery that is really not being shared. A recovery that is. Anemic. You have an economy that is prone to booms and busts, and you have a democracy itself that can't work very well. A democracy that itself is prone to the voices of most people being drowned out by a, a small number, a relatively small number of people at the top. The great jurist, Supreme Court justice. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, in the United States, named Louis Brandeis, once said, speaking about the United States in the late 19th century, the last time we've seen this kind of a yawning gap between a small group at the top and everybody else, he said, the basic choice is we can have a democracy, or we can have huge wealth in the hands of a very few people, but we can't have both. What's happening in the United States? The divisiveness, the polarization, again, is related to this fundamental economic problem. Because when so many people feel that they're working so hard, they're working harder than ever, but they're not getting anywhere. They're actually falling behind. They feel economically insecure. Well, when all of those people feel that the game is rigged against them, 
They get angry. They get frustrated. They are very prone to demagogues on the left or the right, doesn't matter, who want to point a finger of blame at immigrants or at the poor or at the rich, at corporations or at government or at the trade unions. There's a lot of blame to go around. You think British Columbia politics is polarized? <laughs> Let me tell you what polarization <laughs> looks like. When I came to Washington uh, for the first time in the late 1960s, I was an intern in the office of Robert F. Kennedy. Well, those were different times. But what I learned in those years in the civil rights movement, of which I was very, played a very, very small part, in the anti-Vietnam War movement and other movements, I didn't feel, and many of my generation didn't feel we had any choice but to be involved, engaged in politics. When I was 22 years old, I was crossing the Atlantic on the way to Oxford University. I was fortunate enough to get a Rhodes Scholarship, uh, but it was a very stormy North Atlantic. And uh, I had retired to my stateroom, my little cabin, actually, and I thought I'd never come up. I was so sick. But there was a knock on my door, and I opened the door, and there was a, a kind of tall, lanky southerner who had chicken soup in one hand and crackers in the other, and he said, I hear you aren't feeling too well. I thought these might help. My name is Bill Clinton. <laughs> now, what he did not say then, but he said subsequently, was, I feel your pain. He didn't say that. <laughs> but that was the beginning of a, of a friendship, and that was the beginning of a, of a friendship that went right through and has exceeded a period of time where I was Secretary of Labor of the United States. I don't think we did enough. We presided over a very good economy, 22 million net new jobs in the United States, 22 million. And I was single-handedly responsible for every one of those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. But we didn't do enough to, to reverse the fundamental trends toward widening inequality. Now, why is inequality widening in Canada, in British Columbia, in the United States, in Europe, in China, in Japan? What are the forces that are driving this inequality? Well, there are three fundamental forces. One goes by the name of globalization. Globalization. Globalization is one of those words to have gone from obscurity to meaninglessness <laughs> without any intervening period of coherence. <laughs> but let me explain what I mean. I mean, so we're, we're, being, we're in a completely integrated global economy. Uh, some people think that national competitiveness has a lot to do with the profitability and competitiveness of companies headquartered in your nation. That is less and less and less the case. Companies are being global. I remember even when I was Secretary of Labor, I needed a new car, the family car broke down, I went to a local dealership, I found a car that met our needs perfectly, it was a, it was a Toyota, and I remember going back to the office, I hadn't bought it yet, and my political advisor, you see, cabinet secretaries have political advisors, they're usually very young, but they say the obvious when you need somebody to say the obvious. I said to him, you know, I, I found a new car. I'm very excited by it. It's a Toyota. He said, Mr. Secretary, can I remind you, you're Secretary of Labor of the United States. <laughs> Immediately, I understood why he was being paid what seemed like an ungodly sum. And I went back to the dealer, I, and I said, no, 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 I, I need to go somewhere else. And I found another deal. I went to a Ford dealer, a, an American, big three, American nameplate. And I, and I, the next weekend, and I asked that dealer, I said, I, I, said, I want a, a car, uh, but you must tell me, I, I'm interested in this car. It's almost, it was almost as good as a Toyota, to tell you the truth. And I, <laughs> I, thought, I said, I'm interested in this, but you have to tell me, uh, it was this car made in the United States by Americans? And he looked at me for a long instant, trying to decide whether I was one of those or whether I was one of those. And then he looked up with, at, with a smile and said, which would you prefer? <laughs> Everything is coming from everywhere. There is not any such thing as an American car, United States car, British car. Everything, but the parts for every, almost every product are coming from all over the world. We tend to think 
that everything is going to go to the place with the lowest wages. That's another fallacy. If it were, everything were going to the place with the lowest, fa- lowest wages, were, if everything were going to be made uh, and wages were the most critical variable, uh, then everything would be made in where? In Southeast Asia or in Bangladesh. But that's not the case. I had uh, two new hips installed not too long ago, and I was talking about globalization, and I realized I hadn't made a very particular inquiry. I didn't ask at the hospital where they installed my hips, the beautiful new hips, by the way. I can't show you, but you have to take my word for it. I I didn't make a critical, uh, kind of almost an existential inquiry. I I didn't ask where my beautiful new hips were actually made. And I went back to the hospital, uh, and it turned out uh, my hips were actually fabricated in Germany. Now, it's interesting because German wages are actually, the median wage in Germany, in terms of purchasing power parity, is higher than the median wage in the United States. So how can it be that my hips were actually made in Germany instead of Bangladesh? Well, the reason is that what I ended up paying for, and I did end up paying indirectly for hips, was for the precision engineering, for the value added because the technology and the skills in Germany were such that a hip or any kind of precision manufacturing could be done there and generate enormous value. It's not just wages, in other words. It's actually productivity, it's innovation, it is value. And much of that, in turn, depends on education. By the way, my beautiful new hips They were fabricated in Germany. They were designed in France. I have French designer hips. So the real issue here, and it's an issue for California, for the United States, for British Columbia, for Vancouver, for Canada, the real question in terms of standard of living of any group of people is what those people add, the value they add to an increasingly integrated global economy. If you add a lot of value, you will do very well. If you're not adding very much value, you will not do well. Now, I said initially there were three forces. A second force has to do with technology, technological change. There are a lot of new technologies around, and this is not new itself. Technology has been replacing workers or at least making certain jobs obsolete for, well, since the beginning of economies. I remember when I first went to Washington as President Clinton's Secretary of Labor, uh, there was a garage, a, a, a gas station down the road from where I lived, and I used to take my car down and I used to talk to a gas station attendants. I mean, they'd come out, we'd have a conversation, I'd roll down the window, roll down the window. <laughs> and there would be, and I knew them, there were Charlie and there was, there was, there was Jim and, and we would have conversations and I, I developed a, a relationship with them. They'd say very personal things like, can we check the oil? <laughs> but years later, when I came back from Washington, Charlie and Jim were gone. That entire gas station, service station, uh, was not even a service station anymore. There was no service. It was all automated. Where did they go? What happened to them? Well, they joined the legions of millions of others, millions of others. We used to have a lot of bank tellers and telephone operators and all sorts of people. Where have they gone? Many of them are still around. Most of them have gone into the personal service economy, retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital, surface transportation, some construction, child care, elder care. These are the growing occupations for many of the people whose jobs have been supplanted by technology. The problem is most of these jobs pay very little. By the way, when I got back from Washington and I got in my car, you know you're no longer in the cabinet when you get in the back seat of your car and there's nobody in the front seat. (laughs) It's a direct giveaway. So again, what do we do if technology technology is displacing jobs? Where and who are the winners? The winners 
in terms of technology are the people who can utilize the technology, the people who not only understand how to install and upgrade and repair and improve upon, but those people who can utilize the technology to expand the value that they already are adding. They are the ones who have the right skills. They have the right education. They also have the right connections. Force number three, and this is particularly important to places like British Columbia. Number one, again, is globalization. Number two is technological displacement. Again, all of that pushing the workforce apart, creating a small group of people who are winners and a larger group of people who are losers or are not getting ahead. The third force has to do with natural resources. Now, there is a fundamental challenge that any natural resource-based economy faces. And that challenge is that while natural resources are a blessing, they are also an economic curse. They're an economic challenge and they are an economic problem for two major reasons. Number one, because those natural resources are normally owned by somebody or some group, and those owners usually do very well, particularly if there is a greater and greater demand for those resources. But the social costs of utilizing those resources, or transporting those resources, or extracting those resources, often fall on others who are not so fortunate or similarly well-situated. So, so there's a distributional issue right from the beginning with regard to a natural resource-based economy. But there is a second issue as well, and that is that a natural resource-based economy has a currency that is pumped up by the sale of those natural resources internationally. And that pumped up currency is a disadvantage to every industry other than the extractive industries that have generated that pumped up currency to begin with. Uh, Australia is a good example. Australia is becoming a mine and a beach for China. I hope I'm not insulting any Australians here. It's not an insult. I mean, it's a fact of the matter. Australia has wonderful natural resources, and its mining is, and, it's, and the, the, the resources that it extracts are going to China, and that's great, and, and it's getting the benefits of that. But the Australian currency, the Australian dollar, keeps on going up. That makes it more difficult for Australian manufacturers to sell their goods worldwide. It makes it more difficult for high technology in Australia to get very much of a grounding. Do you get my point? A natural resource-based economy can generate huge gains, but those gains come at a cost, and that cost and that benefit may be temporary in any event. Those natural resources are themselves subject to huge changes in the global economy. One minute you can be high, riding very high, the next minute you can be riding very low because commodities and the demand for commodities can go all over the place. And those natural resources and that natural resource base can be temporary in that it can be supplanted by other natural resources, other mines, other findings elsewhere around the world. So be careful. And I say this with an open and positive heart. The United States is also, to some extent, and becoming more and more a natural resource-based economy, and we see some of those same problems. But these three forces, globalization and technological displacement and natural resource and a natural resource-based economy, don't necessarily have to result in very widening inequality. They don't have to create social injustices. They don't have to create median wages that are declining over time. They don't have to create an elite that is having more and more political and influence undermining democracy. No, there's not an economic determinism at stake here and an economic force that cannot be altered. And here is where politics and democracy come in. Because an economy is not out there. An economy is not in a state of nature. The only thing in the state of nature is a kind of social Darwinist process in which the survival of the fittest operates, 
and the survival of the biggest operates. No, economies are based on rules. And those rules come from where? From government, from courts, from legislatures, from agencies. What is property? What is a contract? How are they going to be enforced? What's liability? Bankruptcy rules, antitrust rules, everything else. That is what an economy is based on. Those rules can be designed to maximize efficiency. That's good. They can be designed to maximize growth. That's good. They can also be designed to maximize shared prosperity, which is also good. It's up to us. It's up to the people of a society to determine what's the right mix of those rules. And unfortunately, what we have in the United States and what we see emerging elsewhere around the world in advanced economies are rules that may be doing fine in terms of efficiency and growth, but rules that are not doing well in terms of shared prosperity. And this is where the danger lies with regard to an economy over time and also with regard to a democracy. And on that upbeat note, <laughs> and I am upbeat, I'm really optimistic, and I will tell you why I'm optimistic in a little bit, but I want to get on with our program. I want to ask Anna Maria to come back and we can have a conversation. I want to answer your questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Were you that funny in government? <laughs> well, you know, Washington is filled with people who take themselves too seriously and take the issues they're dealing with not seriously enough. I tried to do the opposite. <laughs> well, let's talk about that because you have said you would not have spent so much of your adult life banging your head against the wall if you did not believe in social change. So what is the most fundamental change you believe we must confront in economies such as Canada and the U.S.? Well, I, I do think that this issue of widening inequality uh, lies very close to the heart, if not at the heart, of many of the challenges we are facing in many dimensions. Uh, there is environmental justice, but environmental justice tracks very closely this question of inequality. Who are the people uh, who uh, have the worst air and the worst water and who are subjected to the greatest risk of disease? They are people who don't have the advantages of others. Uh, issues of democracy, as I stressed before, are also closely related uh, to inequality. The ability of any society to get on with what it needs to do, uh, the fundamental realities of social solidarity the building blocks of us doing anything together at all depend on empathy. And empathy, in turn, depends on us knowing each other. Uh, the rich, at least in the United States today, and to a larger and growing extent in Europe and in Canada, being rich means not having to come across anybody who isn't. So that's another dimension of inequality, the, the walls that it creates, the walls that it creates even in our social interactions. Exactly. Uh, and those walls have to do with a geographic, uh, spatial separation. Uh, we always had rich and poor in the same towns. Uh, I grew up in a little town in northern New York State, uh, and the rich were in one part of the town and the poor were in another part of the town, but we all went to the same school. We all saw each other. And there was a sense of, well, we're all sort of in the same community. Uh, and those connections were very important. They were important in terms of the entire United States. Now we have cities that are rich. We have cities that are poor. We have entire subcultures that don't come across each other at all. And so when it comes time to make decisions that have impacts across class lines, uh, people don't have any idea who is on the other side. And that starts to polarize things. And that leads to polarization, but it also leads to the kind of divisiveness that can be manipulated in ways that generate even greater anger and blame and scapegoating. We are having this conversation in a week where the acrimony over Obamacare has shut down the U.S. government. I noticed. Where you noticed, yeah. <laughs> well, let's start there. Is 
Is this government shutdown in any way linked to inequality? There, there is a connection in the following sense. Uh, number one, so many people are so frustrated and so angry for reasons enumerated I enumerated before uh, that they are very easily persuaded that their enemies are immigrants or the poor or government. And once they're whipped up into a frenzy, it's very difficult to create any kind of political dialogue at all. And secondly, you have some very wealthy individuals who are indirectly or perhaps directly fomenting this. They are financing the Tea Party. Uh, I don't want to sound or get into too much of a partisan discussion here, uh, but I want to be very clear and very frank. Uh, we have a faction inside the Republican Party uh, that are very extreme. Uh, they are demanding concessions from the rest of us uh, that have to do with, in a sense, abrogating the entire legislative process. Uh, they want to amend or delay or repeal an act of Congress that's gone through the entire democratic process as it should, and they are threatening and have threatened to shut down the government if they don't get their way. They're now threatening uh, not even to allow the debt ceiling to be lifted, uh, a problem uh, huge problem, not only for the United States, but potentially for the global economy. Now, there's a deadline looming in about two weeks. Is that a deadline that should, uh, should the U.S. shut down even further that would affect a country like Canada? Absolutely. Uh, it will affect the global economy because if the United States can't pay its debts, uh, interest on the federal debt at the very least, then the value of the Treasury bill, the value of the dollar declines, interest rates spike, uh, the stock market uh, would presumably drop dramatically, uh, and the global financial markets would be in terrible turmoil. I mean, the, uh, the full faith and credit of the United States is a fundamental building block of the entire global economy. And to even threaten this, to even threaten the possibility of not fulfilling the financial obligations of the United States, uh, to me, is the height of irresponsibility. You know, and in this country, you know, there are crucial discussions on such things as oil pipelines and resource development uh, in the West that becomes a verbal battlefield that stretches right across our country. So if you look at the polarization in the states, if you look at the politics of Canada, how do you transcend polarized politics to introduce the kind of change you believe is necessary to put people on a more equal footing? Well, no, there are two things, it seems to me. Number one, people have got to have a common understanding of what the problem is. Uh, instead of name-calling and instead of uh, ideological stereotyping, uh, there's got to be an attempt to have at least a shared vision of why we are where we are and where we could be. And out of that shared vision of what the problem is come some possible solutions. And then secondly, there's got to be an arena in which people can come together and share their visions and share their solutions. Uh, if we continue, and we, I say very generally, certainly in the United States, uh, continue not to have any dialogue at all, uh, then we are going to, uh, it's impossible to come to any solutions. But governments are supposed to be where some of that dialogue takes place, different views. Yes, they are supposed to be. <laughs> I was hoping for a big answer. <laughs> Uh, well, look, at, I mean, uh, uh, here, I, I, I will give you a, a, a kind of a, a very truncated view of what the problem is in the United States. Uh, state legislatures have gerrymandered uh, districts, voting districts, congressional districts. By gerrymandered, I mean they have created odd-shaped districts so that the representative to Congress from that district is safe, knows that he will be or she will be re-elected, Republican or Democrat. Therefore, the primary challenger, that is the challenger in the primary election leading up to that general election, becomes the biggest problem that that representative incumbent has to worry about. And that means that there is no incentive at all to compromise with the other side. In fact, every incentive that exists is to become even more extreme. So how, it, against that backdrop and against polarized politics in, in, even in Canada, what is the role of a new generation of workers and want-to-be workers, of ambitious young people, of students in this audience tonight, in imagining and enabling a different kind of dialogue that can bring about some change? Uh, well, I think that it's important to understand that politics is something that cannot be simply 
allocated to the politicians. And by that I mean that anything decent and good and important that happens politically must be shared or must begin with average people in terms of their understanding, uh, their organizing, their mobilizing, their energizing. Uh, you know, citizenship is not just a matter of paying taxes and serving on juries and, uh, and voting. Citizenship is a matter of being an active participant in the democratic process. And I think that too often uh, we tend to think, and again, when I say we, I'm talking primarily of the United States, but I'm sure Canada and Canadians have this uh, issue as well. We tend to think that once we elect somebody or elect a group of people, then we kind of, that's the end of it, we can go back to normal business until the next election. And that's not the reality. The reality is we've got to be vigilant. And if our politicians know we're being vigilant, they will not be, they will not think they can get away with these things. Well, they will be, I think, uh, more, just a little bit more careful. The moneyed interests or the, uh, those, see in Canada you have much better campaign finance provisions than we have in the United States. Uh, not only do we have uh, basically no campaign finance limits anymore, but the Supreme Court in a terrible decision, Citizens United against the Federal Election Commission in 2010, decided that under the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, corporations are people. <laughs> well, I believe that corporations are people when Texas executes a corporation. Uh, So if we look at the role of, of students in all of this and the questions they have about how they can move forward, I have a question I'd like to go to on video. Um, this is about graduating students wanting to build careers in this economic climate. Let's watch. Hello, my name is Amit. Uh, I am an engineering student at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Dr. Reich, I'm very intrigued by your suggestion that tuition at universities, colleges, and technical institutes should be free, with every graduating student paying a fixed percent of their taxable income towards a fund that finances these institutions. Uh, I guess my question for you would be, how can we ensure that every graduating student is generated a taxable income and is guaranteed an occupation while reducing the risk that they may go into a saturated job market? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I made, uh, the suggestion I made uh, was that a certain percent uh, of that, uh, whatever the uh, income is, uh, be going, go to, into a fund that would pay for education generally. Uh, now, if somebody is only a part-time worker, uh, then uh, it would not be applicable or it could be pro-rated rated with regard to that. Uh, but the, the whole point is... Uh, to get out of the huge student debt load that, that drives so many students uh, into getting the highest paid occupation they can possibly get instead of doing what they want to do, instead of uh, becoming social workers or teachers or other kinds of things. This is do I have some support for this out there? Yeah, okay. This is getting some traction in the United States. There are states, there are universities that are looking at this quite yes, actively Yes, uh, there are states that are looking at this, in fact, uh, and President Obama has, has recently proposed a system that would be very similar to this. So I think it's, it's coming. Uh, but uh, our current system of uh, student debt uh, is just not working, uh, particularly in an environment where you have very high unemployment levels uh, for recent graduates. I have another question for you on video. Um, moving to those who are more involved in business, businesses that are up and running, but they want to do more. Let's watch. I'm Dragana Panic, and I work at Van City Credit Union, a financial cooperative here in the Vancouver region. The banking system is a critical component of the economy. At Van City, our approach to banking is to first identify the needs of people and their communities, no matter where they sit on the income spectrum. Then we use the tools of banking in support of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. We call this values-based banking. My question for you is this. What role do you think the banking sector needs to play to help build a fair, healthy economy? Thank you. Uh, it's a big question. I, I think that uh, community-based banking or regional-based banking has a big advantage over national banks uh, or international banks. And that advantage is this. Uh, the process of lending money or the process of uh, even investing money 
uh, if we're talking about investment banks, entails an acknowledgement, or should entail acknowledgement, that there are social costs and social benefits involved with almost every loan and almost every investment. Uh, and those social benefits and social costs are in a region. You can see, when we used to have community-based banking or regional banking or state banking in the United States, uh, these banks took into consideration when they made decisions about lending, uh, they took into consideration the effect of that loan on the other players in that local or that regional economy. And so that while an individual loan might not be worth it according to their algorithms, uh, they could uh, decide to make that loan anyway because if it is, if it did result in a viable business, that viable business would have multiplier effects elsewhere in that region. Uh, with international banks, uh, big, big global banks, you don't have that same sense of the interdependence of various enterprises uh, on one another. Uh, so I would, uh, I'm urging in the United States to return to state-based banking and, uh, and even community-based banking. The statistics on the number of small banks in the United States that have failed since 08 are devastating. Um, can you go back? Or are they not only too big to fail now, they're too big to not be, like, they're too big to be small ever again? Uh, well, there are not really economies of scale with regard to the giant Wall Street banks. Uh, the only real economy of scale has to do with political clout. Uh, they can use their lobbyists to slow down uh, any bank regulations. I mean, even the Dodd-Frank Act that was passed by Congress that was supposed to prevent a too-big-to-fail occurrence again, uh, that act is not even on, it's not even uh, effectuated yet. It hasn't even uh, been, uh, the rules pertaining to that act have not actually been, uh, uh, been, been uh, emitted by the agencies, and that's because the banks have so much lobbying clout. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, it makes a lot of sense to make banking boring once again, uh, to uh, resurrect in the United States. We used to have something called the Glass-Steagall Act, which separated investment banks from community, uh, from uh, commercial banks. They know their stuff. It's, it's amazing. I, I, you, I mean, we, we, sh we should never, this is one thing the Clinton administration did that I'm, I'm, I'm not pleased about, and that was getting rid of Glass-Steagall. Uh, we need to get Glass-Steagall back. We also need to put a, 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 a lid, uh, a, a cap on the size of the big banks. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, both of those are necessary for the future. In Inequality for All, you say that it isn't that people are wealthy, it's that they use their wealth to entrench their position. You just talked about lobbyists. In other words, they lobby to keep or enhance the rules of the game in their favor. So what's the creative way to change that? Uh, well, the, the question is where you begin. Uh, I tell my students and everybody I meet in the United States, uh, just as I told you and all of you before, that you begin with organizing and mobilizing politics at the grassroots, that you begin to get involved in politics. Uh, that's the only way you can even start a counterweight to uh, big money and the enormous uh, political power of some of the major corporations and some of the uh, biggest banks in the United States. Uh, now, uh, the, the movie that we just did, called Inequality for All, uh, I don't think it's available here yet. I don't think it's showing yet here I in Canada. I got a special screening copy, so I cheated, but um, it's... Um... Well, uh, but, but, there, but there is a website uh, that might be useful to you all out there, uh, and just go to www.inequalityforall.com. And we put together a lot of public policy ideas, but also steps that you can take as an individual or together with your neighbors, and many of them are as relevant to Canada as they are to the United States and relevant to British Columbia. There are, um, there are questions about steps to take, even um, provincially and nationally. We have, another, uh, we have another question now, and I think if I've got the order right, this is, um, this is about businesses in BC. So let's see. Hello, I'm Ginger Gosnell Myers project lead for the National Urban Aboriginal People Study. BC is one of the only jurisdictions in Canada that has not settled treaties with First Nations. 
They hold title and rights to the lands, and this has been affirmed by numerous court cases. Much of the economic development in BC takes place on First Nations territories, but without direct benefit back to their communities. Clearly, the future of BC's economy requires the recognition of these rights and the settlement of treaties. Dr. Reich, how would you advise BC's provincial government to address First Nations title and rights in the context of economic development? Thank you. Well, uh, it seems to me, and again, I don't want to be heard to be presumptuous about what I believe BC ought to be doing with regard to uh, First Nation rights. But it seems to me that if there is going to be uh, payment uh, with regard to extraction or the use of lands uh, for transportation of, of, uh, of, of oil or, or gas or whatever have you, whatever that payment is, ideally, to me, to my way of thinking, ought to be in the form of investments, uh, more and better investments in education, uh, in human capital, uh, because ultimately the game is not natural resources, ultimately the game is human resources. Uh, and that's really what has to be strengthened and developed. I was struck by what you said a few moments ago when you were talking, you, as you talked about resource base, and you, you said, be careful. Yes. Tell us more. Tell us, I, I, I want to hear more about, about how, because... How do you be careful when a whole bunch of other people are saying exploit resources more? Well, look, our two countries uh, on this continent, and this continent has extraordinary resources, abundance of resources. What our two societies and our two countries have done is to, for since the beginning of our countries and before that, exploit the resources. Uh, sometimes we've done it carefully. More often than not, we've done it carelessly. Uh, and by carelessly, I mean that we have created all sorts of environmental calamities, uh, risks, uh, costs, uh, that the particular people who are exploiting the resource are not taking account of because those costs, they do not bear those costs. Uh, so when I say exploit carefully, uh, we probably shouldn't even use the verb to exploit we should probably be talking about utilize those resources carefully, uh, do it in a sustainable way, do it in a way that actually generates over time uh, as much if not more resource, uh, do it in a way that takes account of those social costs, uh, environmental costs, uh, and uh, the effects on inequality, which is the subject we're talking about tonight. Uh, the carelessness with regard to natural resources uh, is no better than carelessness with regard to how we treat our human resources. And they, they both, I think, in both of our countries, and I, I think, the, in fairness, the United States is more careless and has a history of being more careless, but uh, we've got to just be careful. These are our most precious assets, our environment and our people. Uh, and we must, when I say be careful, we must take account of all of the consequences. I was interested to read when you talk about then being careful about human resources that you believe that unions serve a purpose, that um, the drive for lower wages, that the drive for um, economies that that take a toll on actual income, that that they have a bigger place than than a lot of of economic leaders believe they do. Well, of course, unions serve a purpose. You look at the history. Uh, of Canada and of the United States and ask yourself, where did the big middle classes come from? They came from organized labor, making sure... Uh, making sure, organized labor making sure that the fruits of uh, profitability and economic gains were more widely distributed. In the United States in the 1950s, uh, over 30% of American workers in the private sector were unionized. Uh, that built the American middle class. That made uh, absolutely certain that there was a, uh, a market, a consumer market, for the goods and services that were being produced. 
That led to widespread prosperity. For 30 years, between 1946 and uh, 1974, 1975, we had the largest middle class uh, in the, created in the history of the world uh, that was the backbone of American prosperity. And the economy grew every year, faster than it's grown since. And labor unions were a key to that. Uh, but now, in the private sector in the United States, fewer than 7% of private sector workers are unionized. Uh, and you can't possibly exert that kind of uh, power uh, to widen the circle of prosperity when you have fewer than 7% uh, unionization. I say to my students, I talk about trade unions occasionally by my students, and they get this quizzical looks on their faces. I say, have you ever heard of a trade union? They say, no. Uh, well, I mean, uh, it seems to me, and again, I'm, I don't want to be presumptuous about Canada, but certainly in the United States, we have workers, more and more workers, for big box retailers like Walmart, uh, for fast food outlets like McDonald's. Uh, they are being paid uh, a minimum wage. Uh, the typical uh, Walmart worker in the United States is now paid $8.80 an hour, and they are no longer teenagers. These are mostly adults. They are major breadwinners for their families, and that is not a decent wage. They need a union. You point out that the very things that enabled prosperity in North America masked the encroaching inequality the rush of women to the workforce in the 70s and two-income families, uh, the technology that kept us working longer hours, the ability of householders to borrow against the equity in their homes. All of those were opportunities that we embraced, and they benefited us to a certain extent. And then, as you point out, they masked what was actually happening. So what should we be wary of now? What do you believe we need to start thinking about now in order to find solutions that don't bite us later? Well, I think now is the perfect time uh, in both uh, in British Columbia and Canada and the United States uh, to begin looking at the reality of inequality and understanding that this uh, solution is not a zero-sum game in which uh, the middle class and the poor can gain only if the rich do worse or vice versa. Actually, it is potentially and should be a win-win game. The rich would do better with a smaller share of a rapidly growing economy in which there was less dissension and polarization uh, than they are doing now with a very large share of a, an economy that is barely growing in which uh, people are at each other's throats. Uh, so that the rising tide really can, to change metaphors, can lift all boats. That's what happened in the United States between 1946 and 1975. Uh, many people ask me, well, uh, if you think the the United States ought to change what it's doing, whom should we emulate? And I say the United States <laughs> for the first three decades after the Second World War. Uh, why did we lose track of what the problem was, the challenge was, and what the solutions are? Uh, we invested substantially in education. We invested substantially uh, in infrastructure. We had a very equitable tax code. Uh, we had regulations that, that made finance and banking boring. Uh, we made sure uh, that equal opportunity was at least a possibility. We passed a Civil Rights Act, a Voting Rights Act. Uh, we were continuously trying to be vigilant about widening the scope of prosperity, and trade unions were a critical part of that formula. Every single one of those pieces of the puzzle I just gave you Beginning in 1980, we turned our backs on. And when you say we, are you talking governments? I'm talking about government primarily. And I say this with some humility because I was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration, and I don't think we did nearly what we needed to do in any of these dimensions. Uh, but I think that it goes beyond government, honestly, Anna Maria. I, I think it has to do with uh, the public's understanding of how important it is to maintain shared prosperity and what the dangers are when we become careless not just about the environment and our human resources particularly but more generally about the rules of the game uh, and allow the rules to be tilted toward 
uh, the rich getting richer and everybody else languishing or getting poorer. I, I, you know, sometimes I, I think we see increasingly people wanting to get into government in order to pull down government. The idea that we invest, that we use government to do that is seen as a bad thing in our society today. That's too intrusive of government. There's a change in in the philosophy of a, what, what a government is. And we were talking about the Tea Party earlier. I mean, part of that philosophy is, and, and there are um, uh, parallels, if not equivalents, in Canada, where the whole point of getting into government is to reduce government, to get rid of government. How does that play into that, th this equation? Can you imagine how depressing it would be to get up every morning and to be in government and know that your major goal was to reduce or make ineffectual or destroy the institution you are now part of. I, it seems to me that we have to acknowledge that we depend on government to do the things we can't do individually. Now granted, there is a not-for-profit sector. Uh, there are many things that, uh, that we can do collectively that don't depend on government, but look at, in terms of the, the basic building blocks of a society, not just education and infrastructure, but also safety nets for people that fall through the cracks. You in Canada, uh, you do have a national system of health care. It may not be perfect. There are complaints. In the United States, we have tried for years, since Franklin D. Roosevelt decided ultimately not to include national health care in Social Security. Every president since then has at least made an attempt, including a lot of Republican presidents, to move toward a national health care system. Finally, we get the beginning of a national health care system, and look what happens. We get people coming out of the woodwork saying this is a government takeover. Well, let's be realistic. It's not a government takeover. The issue is not the size of government. The issue, the fundamental issue, is who government is working for. You were in the office, you held office in the most powerful administration in the world. United States of America, and yet you were frustrated. You, you're very candid about how you don't feel you did enough, you don't feel that you moved them forward. Um, you actually say that, you know, sometimes you thought that you were sounding off in meetings all the time, that they probably thought you were a nag. Um. <laughs> actually, in the, in the movie, I, I say, in an unguarded moment, that director of the movie was so good, he kept on getting me to say things I didn't really mean to say. <laughs> Uh, I say uh, that I was a pain in the ass to Bill Clinton, and I was. I, I mean, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed uh, thinking back on it because I was saying over and over again, over and again in every meeting, have we looked at the distributional impacts of this particular policy? Are we clear that this is actually going to help the middle class and the poor and the working class, or is this just not going to result in another giveaway to the wealthy? I mean, how have, have we done that kind of research? Are we, and I was just, I. You know, the trouble is, wherever you are, if you're in government or in the private sector or the not-for-profit sector, if you are a broken record, if you say the same thing over and over, people stop listening. How does that inform what you do today? Well, I've tried everything else. I've written books and I've been on radio and television. <laughs> no, but That's why I thought a movie. Why not a movie? I don't... <laughs> The movie's good, the movie's good. But the, but the idea that um, even in prosperity, it's a big ship to turn. It's, uh, it's, it's multifaceted, it's got many tentacles. How do you, so what do you say to, again, let's talk about the new generation coming up who looks at this, what's there, that, who looks at the very inequality that you are so good at documenting and says, I want to change it. Where do they start? Well, I think, I think the place to start, there, there is both this, the question about what is the substantive issue that would be a good place to start. For example, and there are many, many issues, uh, the minimum wage and the earned income tax credit, which is essentially in the United States a wage subsidy for low-income people. Uh, the two together provide a fairly good, not adequate, but a fairly good uh, guarantee. Uh, that if you are working full-time, you're not going to be in poverty. I say fairly good because you also need food stamps. Uh, it's, it's a very brittle and fragile system. But I think what you could aim for 
in British Columbia or in Canada would be a combination of a minimum wage and a, call it a wage supplement for the low, lowest income people that would at least guarantee a minimum level of income if they were working full time. Now, how do you... Uh, so, so let's just say, I mean, there, there, there are 20 or 30 or 40 different policy areas where you might want to work on. And then the question is, how, as a young person, do you begin working on this? Uh, you can get involved in politics. You can get involved in an interest group that is directly aimed at building momentum for that policy. Uh, you can get involved in the not-for-profit sector, and maybe the not-for-profit sector is working uh, toward a set of uh, policies and a set of uh, ideas that are very uh, consistent with a higher minimum wage and a wage subsidy. Uh, I, w I say to young people, I say to people in my, in my class, it doesn't matter where you begin. Begin somewhere. Uh, uh, begin somewhere that's going to, that, that where you have a sense that maybe over time you will move the ball a little bit. Uh, you'll understand your own abilities better the more you try. You'll understand what you find, what aspect of this, this large and amorphous and difficult, difficult thing, uh, what areas you really have a talent in uh, gaining some purchase over. Uh, and you will hopefully uh, have the enormous satisfaction of making a difference, even if it's a small difference. Uh, you also have to be patient. These things don't change overnight. They don't change in three or four years. Uh, these movements, the trade union movement, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, the movement, movement to women's suffrage, uh, any major movement where you are altering the power structure of society takes years and years and years uh, and requires a great deal of patience and fortitude and steadfastness and strategy. At the same time, what you're suggesting is that they, you don't have to tackle everything. Um, a, a slight change in wages can make a big difference in a wider society. Exactly. You don't have to tackle everything. And even a, a small change can make a huge difference in the lives of a large, large number of people. Uh, nor do you have to have official uh, authority. That is, you don't have to wait until you are a president or a prime minister or a cabinet minister. Uh, you can have, as an individual, leading a group of people or facilitating a movement, you can have enormous power. In fact, in some respects, more power. Uh, I remember thinking when I was in President Clinton's cabinet, I remember thinking that I had a huge megaphone, but a very narrow range of things that I could say through that megaphone. Once I left that cabinet, I could say anything I wanted, but I had a little tiny megaphone. <laughs> we have another video question for you, and this comes, uh, this is about businesses wanting to do more. Good evening, my name is Greg Davignon. I'm the CEO of the Business Council of British Columbia. We're a 250 member organization of leading companies in every key sector of the economy of our province. Professor Reich, you've written extensively on social mobility, income inequality, and productivity. And as you know, Canada does very well on mobility metrics and the foundations that create social mobility in our society. But we lag our U.S. counterparts by as much as 30% in terms of our productivity and often lack the innovation to grow small and medium-sized enterprises into large-scale global competitive companies. So my question to you is, given Canada's social mobility advantages and the foundations we have that support it, what can we be doing to lever that to enhance our productivity, grow our economy more effectively to the benefit of individuals, communities, and society as a whole? Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a good and important question. I, I think that creating an environment in which people can start their own businesses uh, is very, very important. Uh, and that means uh, a financial environment as well, uh, where there are startup funds for businesses. Uh, where you have pooled resources uh, so that businesses that are starting up can actually gain advantage, uh, whether it's uh, uh, physical space uh, or it's, uh, it's business equipment, uh, and there is the possibility of, of, of utilizing uh, these shared resources on a, uh, on a, on a finan with a financial advantage that often uh, entrepreneurs don't have if they have to start completely alone. 
but there's something else as well, and that is uh, it's necessary to create a, a culture in which people see success. Young people see that it is possible to succeed uh, by being entrepreneurial. Uh, one of the problems, particularly in poor communities and what we used to call working class communities, is there aren't really many models of upward mobility. They're not models of people uh, who are able, through education and through their own uh, innovations and entrepreneurial uh, drive, uh, do well. And I think that those models are critically important. I would hope that the business community here uh, makes sure that uh, the leaders of business uh, provide young people with not only the models but also with the educational advantages that come uh, from having a world-class education uh, and being able to apply that world-class education uh, to ventures that uh, many, many young people feel like are completely beyond their possibility. Let me say one more thing, because the notion of a very high productivity economy uh, south of the border in the United States uh, must be understood as a statistical uh, truth that is not necessarily a descriptor of the United States economy. Uh, a company can become more productive and the United States can be more productive in terms of output per person uh, by reducing the labor force, the number of people who are actually working. Uh, and that has been going on. Uh, the ratio in the United States today of the population that is actually working relative to the population that is no longer working uh, is as low as it has been in 29 years. Uh, that generates very high productivity because every worker has to work even harder, but it is not necessarily a healthy economy. So let's not assume that the productivity statistics you hear coming from the United States are necessarily indicative of an economy that is working for everyone. really brings up something else in terms of, of, of businesses that feel they are forced to cut back and the workers they hang on to do end up working more. And, um, and, and how, how do you sustain that? How does, where does that go if you don't try another business model? Uh, well, businesses have to uh, show profits. I mean, uh, you know, I, I I like to believe in socially responsible businesses, but if they don't show a profit, uh, if they're publicly held, uh, they're just simply not going to survive. Even if they're privately held, uh, but they are indebted to banks, uh, they're not going to survive unless they show a profit and, and maximize profits. I don't think we, need, we should be uh, uh, indulge in illusions about, about the role of business. Uh, but by the same token, uh, it is very important that the business community understand that workers are consumers, consumers are workers. If people are not paid enough, if they're not sharing in widespread prosperity, they cannot turn around and buy the goods and services that they are generating. And hence you have a downward spiral. Uh, you can't simply rely on exports. Now, that is not, uh, you know, no place can be a net exporter all the time. You have got to rely on your, and this is a, a lesson that even China is trying to apply and learn, and that is you've got to rely on your own indigenous consumers uh, so that if people are not paid well, uh, you can find yourself as a business person uh, in, in great trouble. Henry Ford in 1913 uh, decided to pay his workers three times what the typical factory worker at the time was earning. Uh, the Wall Street Journal accused him of being a, uh, a communist. Uh, but, but Henry Ford was actually a very wise businessman. He understood that if he paid his workers more, uh, other factory owners would have to pay their workers a little bit more as well in order to hold on to their workers. And if workers in general had higher wages, they would be able to afford the Model T Fords that Henry Ford was generating. And indeed, once he started paying his workers more, other factory workers paid their, factory owners paid their workers more, more cars were produced by Ford and Ford's competitors, and Ford made a bundle. 
It's a fascinating story. I was going to ask you about Henry Ford. So I have another question for you from our, uh, we, well, we have some tweets here too, so let's go to the tweet. Um, can the tax system be used to reduce inequality? If yes, which taxes? Well, the tax systems in Canada and the United States are very, very different. Your top marginal income tax rate uh, is close to 45 to 49 percent. Uh, in the United States, uh, we have a top marginal income tax rate that is, uh, it varies between 35 and 39 percent, but in the effective rate, after you get rid of all the deductions and tax credits, and you also understand the capital gains are a big part of a wealthy person's portfolio, uh, the, uh, you know, the Mitt Romneys of the United States are paying a 15% tax rate. Uh, and in the film, uh, Inequality for All, uh, we've got somebody who is earning $30 million a year and who's paying a tax rate of 11%, uh, which is lower than most of the middle class and most of the working class in the United States. Uh, so uh, what is a fair tax rate? I don't know. But I do know that uh, in the 1950s, under Dwight Eisenhower in the United States, whom nobody ever accused of being a socialist, he was a Republican, former general, uh, the marginal income tax on the top income earners was 91%. Uh, and even if you included... It, even if you included all of the deductions, all of the tax credits, it was still substantially over 50%. Uh, and the United States economy uh, never did better. Another tweet. What are your views on the impact of erosion of, public edu of the public education system and how it affects inequality? Uh, well, I think that's a core problem. Uh, if you don't have an adequate, in fact, it's got to be better than adequate. Uh, we've got to invest in early childhood education. We've got to invest... Uh, and I say, I say early childhood education because research shows that those young minds are already uh, formed to a substantial degree by the time they are five years old. Uh, if they are not stimulated adequately, if they don't have uh, adults speaking to them and, and talking to them, and if they don't have access to a stimulating environment, uh, those minds are not going to be ready to learn at the age of five. So it's not just childcare we're talking about. We're talking about actually early childhood stimulating education, uh, and that's a huge and important investment. Evidence suggests the evidence shows, in fact, in the United States at least, and I'm sure it's true of Canada, that those children, out of a random sample, who receive high-quality early childhood education, have a much higher likelihood of going on to college, a much higher likelihood of uh, going on to having a, a pregnancy when they are married, not an unwed uh, a child, uh, they have a higher likelihood of being in a long-term job and being productive, uh, and they have a much lower likelihood of falling into crime than children, again, in the same random survey, the same random sample, uh, who did not get early childhood education. In other words, the, the effects of early childhood education are extraordinary years out. It is one of the most effective, best educational investments any community, any society can make. But it's also K through 12 education, and, we, and we've got to have uh, access, uh, and uh, good access, uh, affordable access, to high quality public higher education as well. I'm going to pick up on your, uh, talking about a community and what a community can do, because we have another video question for you about communities. I'm Leanne Young. I'm the president of SFU's Alumni Association, and I also work here at CBC Vancouver. Hi, Anna Maria. My question for you, Dr. Reich, is what role does a group of well-educated individuals, a community like ours, some with steady jobs and some without, what role do we play in addressing issues of economic disparity and help create opportunities? I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> Well, she has it made. <laughs> A lot of energy. Um, uh, 
Well, I, I, I don't know that, I mean, I think that in a, in a way we've covered a lot of this. I mean, what a, what, what a community can do uh, is ensure uh, that its definition of itself as a community uh, is, su is sufficiently uh, broad that it includes people of, uh, of, of very different economic statuses. I mean, too often today, uh, our community, our definition of community is people who are just like us economically. Uh, and that definition is too narrow. If we enlarge the scope of our definition and understand that we have mutual responsibilities uh, to, uh, to each other within our diverse community, uh, then uh, that's nine-tenths of the game right there. Uh, then, then the question becomes, uh, how do we fulfill our communities? Uh, let me give you an example. In the United States, uh, there has been a great deal of discussion about Detroit. Uh, Detroit as a failing city. Detroit going into bankruptcy. Oh, you know, Detroit made some bad decisions. A lot of hand-wringing about Detroit. What is not talked about is that the county right next to Detroit is one of the fourth most wealthy counties in the United States. That Detroit, nearby Detroit, you have a high technology region that is one of the three highest technology centers in the United States. In fact, if you defined Detroit not as an oasis of primarily black poverty, but defined it more generally as an entire region that had wealthy, that had high technology, and that also had a lot of poverty, then the question becomes a different kind of question. It's what are our responsibilities within this Detroit metropolitan area to one another to deal with the poverty in our midst? That's fascinating. So a lot of what Detroit faces could be solved by a different kind of community involvement? Of course. Of course, if the broader Detroit metropolitan area, that is the counties surrounding Detroit, including those that I've mentioned, thought of themselves as part of Detroit, and Detroit was part of them, uh, the solutions they might come up with could, would have to do with schools, infrastructure, would have to do with opportunities, have to do with banking, lending, small business development, all kinds of things. But instead, it's more convenient to draw a line around this area of very poor black people, primarily, uh, and consign them uh, to a kind of uh, economic limbo or worse. You know, 40% of the streetlights are out in Detroit City. Uh, the infrastructure is decaying. The, the schools are terrible. Uh, well, that seems to me a form of uh, not only or even primarily racial prejudice, but it's also economic prejudice. It's a way of basically saying to, uh, to themselves, many people in the, in the broader area, well, that's not our responsibility. That's them, it's not us. And that speaks exactly to, again, what you talk about with inequality, because it builds up new walls. And there's a fear that we don't want to be like that, so we have to guard what we have even more closely. And there's also this, this hubris that comes with, well, we've managed to do it, they should do it themselves. Well, yes, in fact, one of the, one of the mythologies that have been perpetuated in the United States uh, by uh, the political right uh, is that the greatest challenge, uh, the greatest potential detriment to the middle class and working class are the poor. Uh, that it's the poor who take the taxes of the middle class uh, and basically utilize them for just sitting around uh, and, and, and um, having unemployment insurance or welfare. Uh, that the poor are imposing themselves in ways that uh, reduce the living standards of the middle class. There is that entire mythology uh, is a deflection and distraction from what is really going on. When 95% of the gains of the economy since the recovery began are going to the top 1%, the issue is not the poor taking away from the middle class. The issue is that we have a social structure and an economic structure uh, that is not designed to expand the circle of prosperity or generate shared prosperity in the middle class or among the poor. You said something earlier before you came out on stage that because you teach 
because you're in a university setting on a regular basis, you have a lot of exposure to the 18 to 24 year old group of people. Um, and you can't, you can't have um, too negative a view of the world when you confront those people every day. Tell us about that. Well, you're referring to a discussion that uh, we had before the program began, and, and people sometimes ask me why I am op optimistic, why I am upbeat, notwithstanding uh, the economy that's becoming more and more lopsided, uh, a government that's dysfunctional, everything going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, and, and the reason I am optimistic is not only historical, that is, I know historically, uh, as Winston Churchill once said about the United States, uh, the United States uh, eventually does the right thing after it has exhausted all other alternatives. <laughs> uh, but, but what gives me optimism is uh, that I am teaching, I'm with young people between the ages of 18 and 24, uh, you know, all week long. And it is impossible, it is absolutely impossible to be pessimistic or downbeat when you are surrounded by these wonderful, intelligent, bright, engaging, idealistic young people. Um, go ahead, clap for him on that one. I'm, I'm asking that to get to another question that I have. I'm very interested to know because there's a big discussion in this country about higher education and whether. Uh, students should graduate with um, a skill that can land them the perfect job or that, that they're not learning the right things, whether they should be taking humanities degrees. What's your view on the value of education and, and how students leaving universities and colleges should, should what their expectation should be and what the, the wider societal expectation should be of that higher education? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I think that creeping into our discussion of higher education has been an insidious notion uh, that higher education is a private investment. Now, it may be a private investment to some extent, but it is also a public good. It is like the rest of education. It is a public good. Uh, so uh, higher education is not and should not be about uh, simply getting a great job at a high wage. Uh, it's about preparing oneself for a full uh, and productive uh, life as a citizen uh, and all that entails. I mean, I, when I was an undergraduate, uh, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was an art history major. Now, you might ask, what in the world did art history have to do with what I have spent the rest of my life doing? The answer is nothing. <laughs> but I loved it, and I still love it. Uh, and I, I love art, and I uh, also learned a great deal. And I think I learned a great deal about how to see things uh, and how to think about things. Uh, so that uh, education works on one's mind in all sorts of ways. A narrow vocational view of education, it seems to me, uh, forces somebody into uh, a very crimped and unfortunate position. Now, granted, students have huge student debts. Uh, that is forcing them to be more vocationally oriented than I think is wise, for all the reasons we talked about before, which is why we've got to change the nature of financing. I also think, though, that we should not get into a conceit in which the only way to make it economically is through a four-year college degree. We also ought to provide alternatives. There may be young people who... Uh, there may be young people who would do much better with maybe a the last year of secondary school and the first year of a community college, uh, learning a, an area of technology and technological competence so that they go, can go ahead and continue to learn on the job. There may be uh, other young people who would do much better uh, learning uh, to uh, pursue a, a passion for a particular set of arts or, uh, or music. Uh, a four-year liberal arts degree is fine, but it should not be necessarily the only path 
to success. You make a really interesting point about learning and learning to think and learning to see things. And part of why we're here with you tonight is because we want to hear how you think. And we want to be encouraged to think differently. What do you want us to think about or to act on or to confront in, in our daily lives as this big problem of inequality looms over us? How do we need to think a little differently? Well, number one, uh, I think we, we need to get out of the blame game. That is, every time we're tempted to say, well, uh, we're go becoming more equal because of them, or because of them, or because of that, uh, we've got to stop and understand that we're really dealing with a system, a system of incentives, a system of rules, uh, an organization of the economy, uh, and uh, those rules and that system can be altered and probably needs to be altered in some way. Uh, economies change. Uh, the forces of globalization and technology uh, are themselves changing our societies and economies. So naturally, the rules ought to be altered. The blame game, though, leads us down rabbit holes uh, and ultimately into political gridlock. That's not where we want to go. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think we don't want to be daunted by the size and scale of the problem. Uh, we can make progress, at, as we talked about, Anna Maria, we, we can make progress on different issues. Uh, we can begin to make marginal changes that down the road have big consequences. Uh, we can take pride and satisfaction out of the, uh, the marginal changes that we are making. And if most of us feel more efficacious, more agency, more sense of, uh, of our own personal power politically and economically and socially in terms of actually leading uh, our communities in these directions, uh, then more and more can be done. I think that too many of us are trapped uh, in a sense that the problems are just too vast and I have no power and I have no effectiveness uh, and therefore uh, I'm just not going to even try. A kind of, a kind of cynicism uh, that is the real enemy of social change. So along with thinking differently, we need to take responsibility for the fact that this is our world too. And well, taking responsibility is a matter of thinking differently, honestly. I, I think that it's not just up to the politicians, it's not just up to those who are formally cloaked in authority, uh, it is up to all of us. And if we, and if we don't, what's at stake for this continent? Well, if we don't, uh, what's at stake for British Columbia and Canada is the United States. That is, uh, <laughs> that is, that is uh, the forces that are operating on the United States in terms of inequality, uh, divisiveness, uh, and also uh, kind of uh, a, a centralization of economic power uh, and political power uh, are the same kind of forces that are operating on Canada and every, every other country. Uh, now. Will Canada ever get to the point of the United States? Right now in British Columbia, I believe the top 1%, the last figure I had, uh, is uh, getting about 13% uh, of total income. Uh, I could be wrong, it could be at 14%, but somewhere in that range. Uh, well, that's certainly not nearly, that's not nearly as bad. In the United States, the top 1% is taking up more than 20% of total income. Uh, but compare where British Columbia is now to where you were in 1980. In 1980, the top 1% was bringing home 8% of total income. So you see the trend line is the thing that we need to worry about. Uh, you're nowhere near where we are in the United States, uh, but you're trending in the same direction uh, because many of the underlying forces are moving in the same direction, and that's true of Canada as a whole. You know, I listen to you, and... Um, you, you, you have the statistics, you have the overall economic view, but what you're really talking about is a level of compassion. What you're really talking about when you talk about political ideas and economy are the heartbeats of people in every community. That it all really does come down to how we want to look at our neighbors. Well, it comes down to uh, how we understand um, the, the word we, W-E, uh, and us, 
and who is us? Uh, you know, I think that uh, too many of us for too long have fallen for a, a false definition of nationalism and patriotism. Uh, it's a kind of uh, word number one or a kind of uh, pride uh, that excludes others, uh, that, is a, that makes us better than others. Uh, but the kind of definition of nationalism and patriotism that I think is more useful is, a, is, is really a, a, a sense that we have, because we are citizens of the same country, we have certain obligations to one another. Uh, it's not a matter of us being better than somebody else outside. It's not a matter of exclusion. It's not a matter of flag waving. It's a matter of understanding that with citizenship comes a sense of usness, a sense of mutual obligation. Uh, and that mutual obligation means that we, if we are well suited and well prepared and our children are in very, very good shape, we can't end it there. Uh, we have a responsibility to our compatriots to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to make it. Uh, again, we're not talking about equality of result. We're not talking about equality of outcome. We're talking about equality of opportunity. That's what we're losing. That's what's critical. Robert Reich, you offer a lot of inspiration. You started this evening saying the economy has worn you down. You're a giant. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. No question. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, certainly a food for thought, not even for an evening, not even for a week, but uh, for an entire decade. And, and so, uh, Dr. Rice, you've been so uh, generous uh, with your time, uh, with your intellect, with your experience. I, I think I've rarely seen an occasion where uh, you've taken uh, such uh, uh, complex topics and made them not only so accessible, but so humorous uh, in terms of your uh, way of engaging, engaging with us. I particularly, of course, like the comments that uh, community-based financial institutions and regionally-based financial institutions are the, are the way of the future, so I thank you very much uh, for that. I'm not sure, uh, given all the students in the audience, that I would agree that banking is boring, so don't <laughs> listen to that part. Uh, but but certainly, uh, certainly you've given us a lot to think about and in particular have reminded us that economics is at its heart a social science and uh, that really the solution to some of the most profound economic problems that we see are in fact held by us and that it is uh, democracy and participation and diversity and humanity that will create a stronger economy. And so on behalf of uh, Van City Credit Union, our democratically elected board of directors, our 2,500 <laughs> uh, employees, and our 500,000 members that we are pleased to serve. Thank you so much, both to Anna Maria Tremonti and to Dr. Reich, for sharing your time with us this evening. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tamara, and thanks uh, to everyone at uh, Van City for having helped to support this wonderful evening. On behalf of S SFU Public Square, I also want to join in our appreciation uh, for Robert Reich and uh, incredibly stimulating evening to Anna Maria Tremonti for bringing out uh, the points that I think uh, really made the evening so very worthwhile. 
I also want to thank, it's a huge team of people that have been working to make SFU Public Square the forum that we want it to be, to stimulate conversation, to create that kind of community dialogue that Dr. Reich has said is so important to our democracy. And I want to thank all of them, all the people who've made this evening and the entire SFU Public Square uh, possible. Uh, Shauna Sylvester and her incredible team, please join with me in expressing our appreciation to them. Also, uh, to our sponsors, TELUS, Sandy's Furniture, EIC, and Daniel's Chocolate Belge, and to the co-workers of the We Are BC video, to the people who volunteered to be part of our video questions this evening, and to you. To you for coming out on an evening where you could have been doing something else. I hope you feel that it's been worthwhile and stimulating and part of a true public square. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are in the Twitter world, I want to let you know you're trending not only in BC, you're trending in Canada. That's amazing. And the good news is this community summit is far from over. Uh, there's still an opportunity for you to join with us tomorrow night. Tomorrow night was our comedy night, but it turns out we got a bit of comedy tonight as well. And I suspect tomorrow we'll get a bit of, a bit of message along with the comedy, so it's all going to work wonderfully. But tomorrow night at the Gold Corp Center for the Arts at Woodward's, we'll have our closing, It's the Economy Stupid, a comedy cabaret led by Richard Side and Charlie Demers of the Debaters. So check your program for details. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good night and good luck. Thanks. Thanks.